Morning, everyone, or good evening, good afternoon, depending on where everyone is. Uh, Minister Burita, uh, Minister Lapid, Dr. Gargash, uh, Ambassador Al Khalifa, friends, uh, it's very, very good to see all of you, and, and, and thank you for being here. And to our Israeli colleagues, Shana Tova. Uh, Happy New Year. You know, uh, September 15th, 2020, leaders from Bahrain, Israel, the United Arab Emirates signed the Abraham Accords. A few months later, on December 10th, Israel and Morocco also signed a normalization agreement. Today, a year after the accords and normalization agreements were signed, the benefits continue to grow. Uh, we're seeing deepening diplomatic relationships. It's been a year of firsts. The first Israeli embassy in Abu Dhabi, the first embassy of the United Arab Emirates in Tel Aviv. This month, Israel named its first ambassador to Bahrain. And earlier this week, Bahrain's first ambassador to Israel presented his credentials. Minister Lapid, your visit to Morocco last month to meet with Minister Burita and others was the first by an Israeli minister to the kingdom since 2003. And both countries recently opened liaison offices that are expected to be upgraded to embassies by the end of the year. We're seeing growing people-to-people -people ties, even with the serious challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Diplomatic relations have made it possible to fly between Israel and Bahrain, Israel and Morocco, and Israel and the United Arab Emirates. Some of these flights have never been allowed before. Uh, your governments are making it easier for your citizens to take advantage of those flights. For example, Israel and Bahrain were the first countries to mutually recognize one another's digital COVID-19 vaccine passports, which means that people from your countries can go to restaurants and concerts when visiting each other's countries without quarantine. And the people of your countries are seizing the opportunity. Again, despite COVID-19, more than 130,000 Israelis visited the United Arab Emirates just in the first four and a half months after the accords were signed. Uh, there is a hunger to learn about each other's cultures, to see new sites, to try new foods, forge new friendships, all experiences that have been impossible for so long uh, and for so many, and now they're making up for lost time. We're seeing new economic opportunities, uh, innovations, collaborations. Uh, the United Arab Emirates has pursued significant investments in strategic sectors in Israel, including energy, medicine, technology, healthcare. Private firms across your countries are working together on everything from desalinization uh, to stem cell therapies. These opportunities would be exciting at any time, but they're particularly important today as we work to build back better from the devastating economic impact of the pandemic. The deepening diplomatic relationships also provide a foundation to tackle challenges that demand cooperation among nations, like reducing regional tensions, combating terrorism, mitigating the impact of the climate crisis. And we all must build on these relationships and growing normalization to make tangible improvements in the lives of Palestinians and to make progress toward the longstanding goal of advancing a negotiated peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Palestinians and Israelis deserve equal measures of freedom, security, opportunity, and dignity. This administration will continue to build on the successful efforts of the last administration to keep normalization marching forward. We'll do that in three main ways. First, we'll help foster Israel's growing ties with Bahrain, with Morocco, with the United Arab Emirates, as well as with Sudan, which has also signed the Abraham Accords, and Kosovo, which established ties with Israel at the beginning of the year. Second, we'll work to deepen Israel's long-standing relationships with Egypt and Jordan, partners critical to the United States, Israel, and Palestinians alike. It was 43 years ago, today, that Egypt and Israel signed the Camp David Accords, and next month will mark 27 years since Israel and Jordan signed the Wadi Araba Treaty. The visit to Cairo this week by Prime Minister Bennett to meet with President Sisi, the first trip at this level in over a decade, and the negotiations between Israel and Jordan around new agreements on water and trade show how these relationships continue to build on the trailblazing agreements signed decades ago. And third, we will encourage more countries to follow the lead of the Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco. We want to widen the circle of peaceful diplomacy because it's in the interests of countries across the region and around the world for Israel to be treated like any other country. Normalization leads to greater stability, more cooperation, mutual progress, 
all things the region and the world need very badly right now. Let me close by bringing us back to the primary beneficiaries of normalization, people across borders whose lives will be improved by these new possibilities. Abdullah Bakir is an investor who co-leads the newly created UAE Israel Business Council. He wants to spend a month in Israel to learn more about its people and culture so that he can better connect entrepreneurs in the two countries. He says, and I quote, everything is possible if we sit together and have a dialogue and understand each other. Ibrahim Nonu is the head of the Jewish community in Bahrain. Just last month, he led Shabbat services in a synagogue for the first time in 74 years, making Jewish life visible in Bahrain for the first time in generations. And so many people are eager to rekindle long-standing connections that had been cut off until now. More than a million Israelis have Moroccan heritage, including five ministers in Israel's current government. How meaningful it will be for more Israelis of Moroccan descent to travel back and forth between the two countries, rediscover cultural ties, and pass them on. The 2020 World Expo was delayed by COVID-19, but it will soon open in Dubai. The Abraham Accords had not yet been signed when Israel's pavilion was first conceived. It consists of seven consecutive freestanding gates, no walls, completely open. Across the final gate is a giant sign that reads, For Tomorrow, in a script that combines Arabic and Hebrew letters. What an apt metaphor for the new horizons that open when countries are no longer closed to each other. Thanks to the countries here today, others who have joined, and the people forging ties between these nations, that vision is becoming a reality. May it be a model for others to follow. Thank you all. Well, apparently, uh, Mr. Secretary, being the one with the longest history as a host of, of talk shows, we need your direction. Who, who should start? So uh, maybe my friend Nasser Burita. I think, far, uh, I think yes. I think our, our, our friend from Morocco is next up. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary of State, Your Highness, dear colleagues and friends. Allow me first of all to commend you, dear Tony, for this opportunity to renew together our commitment for peace. The normalization of relations with Israel is indeed a historic event that is worth commemorating. It fostered new hope and paved the way for an unprecedented mom momentum. Although Morocco's relationship with Israel preceded the Abraham Accords by a few decades, we do recognize and subscribe to the significant impetus generated by the resumption and revival of relations. As you all know, in our case, it is the U.S.-Morocco-Israel agreement signed last December under the auspices of His Majesty King Mohammed VI that is the bedrock for the renewed relationship. For His Majesty, this signing reflects the profound links between the kings of Morocco and the large Moroccan Jewish community. At the same time, it ties in with the spirit and the dynamic generated by the Abraham Accords. I would like to take this opportunity to reiterate Morocco's sincere appreciation for the pivotal role of the United States as sponsor and guarantor to this process. Colleagues and friends, Winston Churchill was right when he said that peace will not be preserved by pious sentiments. Yes, the normalization accords are the result of goodwill, lots of it. But more than anything, we see action. Since the signing of the trilateral agreement and following the high instructions of His Majesty, many bilateral actions have been undertaken. Let me name a few. We have established a platform of bilateral dialogue and cooperation around five main sectorial working groups. Our government official talk meet and work together. Around dozen ministers initiated direct contacts 
laying the ground for the signing of more than 20 agreements. Diplomatic missions have been opened and are operational. We have established, and I welcomed myself, my friend uh, Yair last month, and we look forward to other important visits, including of ministers of economy and defense. Channels have been opened between the business communities through the establishment of the Moroccan-Israeli Business Council and the Morocco-Israel Chamber of Industry. We are happy to note that exchanges grow 50% just in the first six months of 2021. 20 flights operating under two airlines companies already established their rotation, and one million Israeli tourists are expected per year to visit Morocco. Partnerships in sensitive sectors have been launched, including in cybersecurity and interoperability of forces through joint military special forces exercises like the HD Annual 21, to which Morocco participated. Colleagues and friends, the challenge of reconnecting was a great one, but it is now behind us. The challenges of preserving, improving, and giving sense to the normalization are still ahead of us. I see four elements or areas in this regard. First, the impact of the normalization process is meant to be felt in generations to come. We must actively and constantly demonstrate benefits on regional peace and security, on people-to-people -people relations, on business opportunities. These are the best arguments for other countries to follow suit. Second, relaunching the peace process is fundamental. Morocco believes that there is no other alternative to a two-state solution with an independent Palestinian state within borders of June 67. Besides, and for His Majesty King Mohammed VI, Chairman of Al-Quds Committee, the status of Jerusalem has to be preserved as a common heritage of humanity, as a symbol of peaceful coexistence of the followers of the three monotheistic religions. Morocco has always played a significant, still discreet role in facilitating peace in the past and is ready to pursue this role today. Third, the normalization did not generate only sympathy. It generated animosity as well. Such animosity must be dealt with with vigilance and solidarity. For example, and unfortunately, one neighboring country decided to sever its relations with Morocco, pretexting, among other things, the reestablishment of relations with Israel. Fourth, there is a need for a new regional order, where Israel is a stakeholder and no longer an outsider in its own region. This new regional order should not be perceived as against someone, but rather to benefit us all. Also, this new regional order should be based on an updated joint assessment of threats, but also on how to generate opportunities that favor stability and development for all. Colleagues and friends, today we are showing to the whole region and the world that brave actions must be taken by all of us in order to push the envelope a bit further for greater good. Again, thank you, my friend Tony, for convening this important meeting and stay assured of Morocco's unwavering and continuous commitment to doing what it takes to contribute genuinely to regional peace and stability. I thank you. Nasser, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, now the floor is yours, Zaire. Yes. Uh, there's only one correction I want to make to my friend uh, Nasser Burita. This is not colleagues and friends, it's friends and colleagues. Friends far, far most. As, as the secretary has mentioned, uh, today, September 17th, is the 42nd anniversary of the signing on the White House lawn of the Camp David uh, uh, agreements. Uh, Menachem Begin, the late Menachem Begin, Anwar Sadat, uh, and, and Jimmy Carter, who's still with us, stood on the lawn of uh, the White House si signing peace agreements. And since then, two of them has died, assassinated, and regimes and governments came to power and fall out of power in both countries, but the peace lasts because peace has this 
this, this energy to it and tendency to last longer than the people who are signing it and made this piece last long after all of us are gone. Uh, and we have to also mention the fact that this, this Abraham Accords Club is open for new members as well. And one of our goals, our common goals, is to make sure that other countries will follow suit and join us in these accords and in this uh, 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 new era of cooperation and friendship. The relations between countries are always the right mix of interests and friendship that is based on values. Uh, what Henry Kissinger used to call the right mixture between the ideal and the real. Uh, and in this event, the ideal and the real are, are completing each other. And as long as all of us are involved, they will continue to complete each other in, in friendship. If you look at the last year, ambassadors uh, were appointed, embassies were built, we launched uh, direct uh, flights. Uh, uh, we have mutual visits. We have signed dozens of agreements in this last in this past month, and many other many are to follow. And uh, we have more than 60, 650 million dollars in in direct trade, and extra hundreds of millions in in uh, uh, in, in other uh, uh, agreements. We have. Uh, cooperation in, in the academy. We have uh, uh, both with the UAE in Bahrain and with Morocco to follow. And we're going to dedicate the next couple of years to strategic projects of, of infrastructure, uh, mostly water, energy, security, food, connectivity, and all of this is going to happen on a regional level. Um, um, the COVID-19 has taught us all that there's no such thing as local problems or local ch challenges. All challenges and all problems are global. And uh, uh, the same way we have dealt together with the COVID-19, we're going to deal with positive things as well, with creating an economy, with creating an atmosphere, with uh, uh, creating a new discourse in, in the region. Looking forward, uh, by the end of the month, I'm going to visit Bahrain for the first time uh, ever for an Israeli minister. Uh, and we're talking also about, and I've discussed this in length with Minister Burita when I was in Morocco, we're going to have three plus one and three plus two and three plus three. We have, we're going we're gonna to make this a bigger and bigger event and a bigger and bigger initiative for peace in the region. Uh, on top of this, uh, I have only this week I have uh, uh, launched my my uh, initiative about um, economy for security in uh, Gaza, trying to stabilize the Palestinian arena as well. So I'm, I invite you all to be part of this initiative that will uh, help both for the Palestinian economy and to secure and help uh, uh, help to secure uh, the entire region. So this is, this is an optimistic event, and uh, it was created by optimistic people for uh, a better future. And, um, and, and um, I couldn't be happier uh, uh, than doing this on the 42nd anniversary of the Camp David agreements. Um, and the Happy New Year, Shana Tovaf to you all from the people of Israel. Yeah, thank you very, very much. And uh, optimism is definitely a good thing. We need more of it, and we need to uh, uh, be energized by it. So I appreciate that very much. Uh, Ambassador Al Khalifa, Abdullah, over to you. Thank you, Honorable Secretary. Uh, Your Excellencies, allow me to uh, personally rally the appreciation of His Excellency Dr. Abdullah Khalifa Rashid Asayani, Foreign Minister of the Kingdom of Bahrain for convening this very important gathering to celebrate the first anniversary of the signing of these historic agreements. The foreign minister unfortunately couldn't join us today's, to today's uh, virtual meeting, owing to being en route to New York uh, for the 76th session of the UN General Assembly. But he has asked for his remarks to be included in the form of a recorded video. And so please allow me to uh, turn the floor to the foreign minister's recorded message. Thank you. 
Secretary Blinken, Your Highness, Your Excellencies, thank you, Secretary Blinken, for hosting this virtual event celebrating the first anniversary of the signing of the Abraham Accords. I'm delighted to join you today as we not only recognize what has been achieved, but also look ahead to how we can build on these historic agreements to take forward the peace, stability, and prosperity of the entire Middle East and its peoples. Because the past year has clearly shown that despite challenges, change is possible for our region, that there really can be a path towards security and cooperation for us all. Already, we have seen further countries joining the process. And I am so pleased that we are joined from Morocco by my brother, His Excellency Minister Boreta, also with His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nahyan from the Brotherly United Arab Emirates, and His Excellency Minister Yair Lapid from the State of Israel. And already we are seeing our cooperation bear fruit with a host of agreements and cooperation projects between the countries involved. In Bahrain, we have moved quickly to consolidate our new ties with Israel and to seize the new opportunities they have created for the benefit of both countries and the region. I'm particularly pleased that our first ambassador to Tel Aviv has this week presented his credentials to President Herzog. The first step in what I am sure will be a full role in developing our ties. Indeed, the Kingdom of Bahrain has been proud to be at the forefront of this historic process, showcasing our deep-rooted values of dialogue, mutual respect, and coexistence, and demonstrating how they can make a real practical difference on the regional and international stage. Looking to the future, we must make sure that this past year is only the start of the process and sustain the genuine momentum and progress we have seen. We need to redouble our efforts to highlight the benefit of our cooperation, whether bilateral or multilaterally among the countries involved. We need to demonstrate what genuine regional peace, interdependence, and prosperity can mean in practice for the day-to-day -day lives of all the peoples of the Middle East. And we need a real push to resolve the underlying issues affecting the region, most notably the importance of a just and comprehensive resolution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. All of this will require real engagement and support from our friends and allies around the world. Not just those involved in the Abraham Accords process, but all countries with a genuine interest in a peaceful, secure, and stable Middle East. The Kingdom of Bahrain, therefore, welcomes the strong and active support from the Biden administration. And I want to thank you, Secretary Blinken, for your close involvement in this ongoing historic process. It is my hope that as the benefits become increasingly clear and with the assistance of our international partners, the region will move forward towards a cooperation of which we can all be proud. Secretary Blinken, dear colleagues, I want to close by congratulating all the countries represented here today on what we have achieved together so far by underlining the Kingdom of Bahrain's 
continued and active commitment to this process and by looking forward to further progress towards our shared goal of a peaceful, stable, and prosperous Middle East. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And, and uh, Abdullah, please convey uh, our gratitude uh, to the minister for his uh, participation. And uh, we very much look forward to seeing him uh, in, the in the days ahead. Uh, and now, Dr. Gagash, Anwar, so good to see you. Good to uh, see you. you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, I, I, I would actually like to start by wishing uh, Minister Lapid, uh, Israelis, and uh, the Jewish people a Happy New Year. So I think that uh, I would like to start with that. And I hope that this is a year where we can consolidate our relationship, bring a better uh, prospects for the future for all of us uh, joined together. But uh, the first anniversary of the Abrahamic Accords is a truly an auspicious occasion. And it certainly is an occasion to celebrate uh, peace, stability, opportunity uh, are things worthy of celebration in our region. And I think they should really be keywords in uh, the a region that we all know is extremely difficult. Looking uh, back a year ago and seeing this positive new normal, we in the UAE are very, very encouraged. We're encouraged with uh, what has taken place. We're encouraged with our communications with the Israeli side. We are encouraged with the opportunities that are there. And, uh, you know, a lot has happened uh, in the past year. And I would say that a lot of positive, really, things have happened. And this is really a counter narrative for a region that needs a positive counter narratives. I also take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank the United States for if it wasn't for the American role, this wouldn't have been possible. And the continued engagement uh, of the United States uh, in this uh, initiative in expanding uh, the Abrahamic Accords and diversifying the benefits of peace is something that is welcome because America is best when it can congregate friends together and allow them to prosper and allow them to build uh, uh, to build a, a positive future for a very troubled uh, region. I would say that uh, the, the main achievement of the Abrahamic Accords uh, in the beginning was breaking the psychological barrier. And I think once that psychological uh, barrier was broken, this was really the difficult part. And uh, following that, a lot of things and opportunities have appeared, people-to-people -people opportunities, economies, even our ability really to consult on political issues. The messages of hope and opportunity and opportunities are the language that we all like to hear. And uh, these opportunities are in a myriad uh, selection or grouping of, 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 of things that we can do in technologies and life sciences and health and agriculture and tourism and in simpler things really of uh, allowing Israeli companies to expand and allowing uh, country uh, companies from uh, uh, our countries also to expand and partner. And I think these are all positive messages as we celebrate the first anniversary. Uh, politically also, we feel that the Abrahamic Accords uh, will allow, allow us to help and assist further in the peace process. Uh, leading uh, to what we all see as the ultimate goal of a two-state two solution. This, of course, will be up to the Palestinians and Israelis to agree. But I think we can all be more constructive as we build a network of trust. And that network of trust, I think, will allow us to uh, put away a lot of the uh, fears of the past and uh, replace it by the hopes for uh, the future. But the most important message also uh, from my perspective 
is really to a demographically young region. This is a region where uh, all of our countries are demographically very young. And I think the Abrahamic Accord has been received with uh, overwhelming support among the, the young in the United Arab Emirates, because they can see the, that this is a narrative that is positive. It's a narrative of opportunity, of peace, of doing things together, and uh, also understanding that countries can have very fruitful and forward-looking relations, but can disagree on issues and need to work the disagreements uh, together. It can't be just zero sum games, but it has to be positive as we move forward. The messages of the great possibilities for peace and cooperation are these messages that we are sending uh, to the young. On behalf of uh, the UAE government, I will say that we will continue on what we see as a strategic path. We will continue with our utmost uh, uh, power and initiative in, all the, in order to make it wider, to make it deeper, and to make it more diversified. And uh, I would end by saying that the, the, the satisfaction of building bridges is a satisfaction that has a moral compass and it's a satisfaction that has economic and political opportunities. Thank you very much. Anwar, thank you very much. And uh, my thanks and gratitude to, uh, to each of you. I think uh, you've, you've each underscored uh, eloquently and powerfully uh, why this is such an important moment to mark um, and why the vision uh, of uh, each of your countries uh, is already demonstrating uh, concrete uh, results uh, and a vision now that carries forward. You know, uh, Abraham uh, in, in our Bible had the uh, temerity to uh, engage God, uh, to, to argue with God, uh, to, to ask why, and, and maybe more important, <laughs> to ask why not. Uh, and I think each of you uh, and each of your countries asked, why not? And uh, the answer now we see before us uh, with the, uh, the accords, with normalization, and with the manifest benefits that it's bringing uh, to people, uh, not just in the countries concerned, but I think increasingly more, more broadly. So it's um, both... Um, an honor and, uh, and an imperative for the United States to continue strongly to support uh, everything you're doing and, uh, as several of you have said, to, to widen the circle uh, going forward. So thanks for spending the time today. Looking forward to seeing each of you in the, uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Hope to see you next year in Israel. <laughs>